So, um, so <clears throat> what I figured I want to talk about today is something that my group has been working on for the past three years to figure out if there's such things as, a, as inductive effects in ionic conductors. And we know inductive effects from, um, from organic chemistry. And so the question is, uh, do we even find that in the solid state chemistry? Well, so as, as Malachi said, a, a large part of my group is, is, is motivated by the idea of moving from lithium ion batteries to solid state batteries. And here you have a schematic of a, of a lithium ion battery with the balanced electrodes, a thin separator, and a, and a liquid electrolyte that per, per, perfectly wets and percolates um, all of the active particles. And, the idea behind solid state batteries is to really just replace the liquid, have a solid separator, a solid cathlite, and then a lithium metal anode. And um, at least the, the hope so far is that uh, we should get higher energy densities, fast charging, and things like that. And I think companies, especially last week, have um, announced uh, quite some major push there. Um, but to be able to do that, you, of course, need a good percolation, good interfacial contact, electrolyte stability, all of these things. But in the end, you still need more electrolytes that have conductivities in the order of 10 millisiemens and above. Um, and this is mostly because we will have percolation and tortuosity issues in these solid state batteries. And so if you really want to go to a thick electrode configuration, you need high ionic conductivities. And this is sort of where my, where my group tries to tackle things. And uh, we've, at, at some point, we've compiled conductivities in, in certain materials classes. Um, and um, so these, all of these bars are sort of one materials class, one structural family. And if you, for instance, look at the agaridides, one structural family, the conductivities you can find based on the composition can over um, change your orders of magnitude. And um, even their activation barriers uh, change, change quite significantly. So even within the same structural family, we can have tremendous changes in ionic transport. And our question is sort of, can we understand why and can we use that knowledge to, to guide the design of materials? Let's look first at what ionic conduction actually is. It's In principle, it's a simple process. We have an ion, in this case, a lithium ion, sitting on a specific lattice side that wants to jump to an adjacent side. By doing that, it needs to displace the lattice a little bit, so it needs some space. All of that costs energy, and that's our delta G of a jump. And this is what we usually call the energy landscape, activation barrier, however you want to call it. And there's a lot of structural influences on this activation barrier. And you can just go to solid state chemistry textbooks. It'll tell you you need a high number of available sites. I um, mean, if, if already lithium is sitting here, it can't jump there. You need a high dimensionality. Anything that is three-dimensional transport is usually better than one-dimensional. You need ideal polyhedral connectivity. So anything that every lithium that is sort of in a phase sharing configuration, it's an easier jump through a phase than, than uh, a site uh, or the edge of a polyhedron. Things like the change of coordination environment matters uh, in terms of energy landscape. I'm not going to go too deep in detail, but the typical approach that we use in solid state chemistry, besides trying to change the, the number of available sites, is the idea that we can change the width of the fusion pathway. So if we would make this bottleneck here, and we, all, we often call it a bottleneck, if we make this broader, then the lattice doesn't need to be displaced as much, and then we should already have a lower activation barrier. And this is sort of schematically shown here. If these cages, in this case, uh, of, of an, an ion jumping to the next side, if they're larger, and this, this window here is larger, and then our activation barrier should be lower and our conductivity higher. And this is sort of the typical paradigm in the field. And um, let's just blow up the unit cell structurally, everything will be better. But there's always the idea it's like how much does the polarizer, lattice polarizability matter or the strength of bonding interaction itself. And the strength of bonding interaction, this is something that I really want to talk about today. Um, be, before I motivate why we looked into this, let me just explain the material um, that we've worked with um, so that you get a better understanding of it from a structural perspective, because this will be a little bit of a structural talk as well. So we work with the, the, the so-called LGPS, lithium 10 germanium P2S12. It's a thiophosphate. So you have these orthothiophosphate units. You have germanium and phosphorus um, sharing a tetrahedral site that are linked by these lithium octahedra. Um, not too important, but what's really important is you have these beautiful tunnels of lithium, of two lithium positions, lithium one, lithium three, um, in the Z direction. So you have really, really fast transport along that direction. And, and early on, um, 
uh, a few years ago, we were able to show by uh, neutron diffraction and, and MEM um, that uh, lithium really shoots down these tunnels. So these are uh, red. This is just pretty much a high concentration of lithium that you find experimentally in the structure. And um, you can see a really good diffusion in the Z direction, but you also have a little bit diffusion um, in the in the XY plane. So it is pretty much a three dimensional conductor, but the tunnels seem to be dominating. There's been there's been cool work on an actually grown single crystals showing that the, the conduction in the tunnels is dominating. And this we need to keep in mind. And so the dominant diffusion pathway really is this lithium one jump to lithium three, lithium one, lithium three. And that'll become important. Now, what motivated us to look at inductive effects? Well, um, the, the typical approach is, like I said, we blow up the unit cell. And the best way to do that usually is uh, isoelectronic substitutions. So uh, a few years ago, nearly three years ago, um, we started substituting germanium with tin. Tin is larger, this should increase the unit cell volume, should make the conductivity better. And what we can see, if we look at the volumes from refinements of these polyhedra, this uh, germanium tin, uh, polyhedra really expands. So we're really putting tin there and the PS4 unit stays the same. So this is really just one side in the structure where we're putting tin. Now we do see that the unit cell expands. We also see an increasing C over A ratio. It doesn't matter how you want to plot it. With increasing tin content and increasing unit cell volume, the conductivity decreases. And this is entirely different to anything the field usually does. So uh, we got startled by this. And you can actually see that the activation barrier is increasing the larger the unit cell volume is. And so um, back then we, we put forward uh, the idea um, pretty much just to please the reviewers um, of, of what this, uh, this, could, this, this effect could be, is that there's an, an, a difference, be, there could be an, a difference between electronegativity between germanium and tin. I mean, we know that there's a difference, so we can look at the different uh, scales down here. Germanium is a little bit more electronegative than tin. So the idea behind it is that germanium in its covalent bond is more electron pulling, pulls more electron density away from the sulfur. Tin, on the other hand, is already larger. You have a longer bond. It's less pulling electron density. So you have more electron density, negative electron density sitting on the sulfur. This higher electron density on the sulfur should mean a stronger attraction, prolombic attraction to lithium. Whereas in the germanium case, there's a weaker attraction between these polyhedra and the lithium. And the weaker attraction should lead to lower activation barrier because it just costs less energy to sort of break this bond and make the ion jump. This was sort of our hypothesis back then, but this hypothesis are one thing and uh, nice chemical uh, intuition. I mean, I think from an intuitive point of view, this is actually a cool explanation, but um, that doesn't mean that this is actually a real effect. And so this is something that we've been we've been working on in the past uh, three years, pretty much. Um, we are together with Ben Morgan, a theoretician at the University of Bath, um, because experimentally um, you can't do everything um, I've learned. And um, we've decided on three steps to prove or at least disprove the hypothesis. And so first we went along to measure the bond strength of the series. Um, we figured out how to calculate these bonding interactions. And we wanted to find actually experimental evidence in a changing lithium substructure. Let me quickly, quickly walk you through all of these. The first thing that we did is we measured the bond strength of these polyhedra. And I saw that Tom Brenner is here. He will, he will agree that Raman is a cool uh, uh, method. And um, you, can, you can pretty much measure the Raman shift of these uh, tetrahedral symmetric vibrational modes. And from the symmetric modes, you can calculate from the Raman shift the force constant that these polyhedra have. Now we've just weighed the force constants over the composition um, from the refinement. And you can see when you go from germanium to tin, the average force constant of these tetrahedra decreases. Expect that uh, it's a longer bond. Um, we can also measure the bifrequencies of the full lattice sort of as, a, as an average metric of the bond strength in, in our materials. And this also decreases from germanium to tin. So the, the intuitive idea that the bond strength from the germanium sulfur to the tin sulfur bond decreases um, is experimentally observable, at least. But how does the bonding interaction change? And so Ben started to calculate um, COHP, so crystal orbital Hamiltonian populations, which give you an idea of how strong uh, a bonding is. And the germanium sulfur bond is more negative. So it's, it's a stronger bond than the tin sulfur bond. 
Okay, this doesn't tell us much. So we need to look at the charges because we're all explaining everything based on a higher and lower charge density here. And so if you if you calculate the, the net atomic charges, um, and um, he's run a, a lot of different approaches to calculate charges because there's a lot of theoretical approaches that you can use to calculate charges. Um, the sulfur on the germanium S polyhedra is always more positive and tin is, is more negative. So there seems to be more electron density on the sulfur. And if you calculate bond polarity, tin sulfur bond is more polar. So the higher polarity is, is pretty much what our intuition has told us. So in the theoretical work seems to hold up. But can we actually find experimental evidence? And so we, we collected neutron diffraction data temperature dependent to see, to sort of normalize out any temperature effects. So all the data that, you, that I'm showing here, all the error bars are sort of averages over, uh, over the temperature dependence. And um, I'm just showing the lithium one, lithium three, um, here because these are the ones that change the most and these are our dominant pathways. And so um, this was the initial representation that I showed, but let me zoom in a little bit. Um, lithium-1 and lithium-3 are directly coordinated to the crystallographic sulfur-2 site. Lithium-1 is a little bit further away than lithium-3. Now plotted here are on the left are the sulfur-lithium distances. So in blue, the sulfur-lithium-1 distance, and going from germanium to tin, from left to right, nothing really changes within the error bars. But what does change is the bond of lithium-2 to lithium-3, that distance decreases. So with increasing tin content and increasing electron density here based on the calculations, this distance of lithium-3 to lithium-2 shrinks. And this is remarkable because our unit cell is expanding, right? We see shrinking distances despite the fact that the unit cell of the material is expanding. What else do we see? We can look at the lithium occupancies. Um, here in, in light blue, uh, light yellow, uh, green, uh, it's really early in the morning. Um, uh, <laughs> the, the green uh, going from germanium to tin, the occupancy decreases and the lithium three occupancy increases. So it's not just that this distance here of sulfur two to sulfur three shrinks, but there's also lithium pulled from this, uh, this position to the lithium three position. So this, this, to me at least, suggests that there's real structural influence of, of this electrostatic um, um, attraction that not just the changing distance, but also lithium is pulled towards that position just to uh, accommodate the, the higher uh, negative electronic charge. And now of course, um, we can use all these things to build correlation. If there's causation, I mean, we can argue that afterwards, but um, if we plot the, the, the sulfur lithium distance versus the force constant, a smaller force constant of your polyhedra, higher electronic charge on the sulfur, means a shorter distance and with that uh, increasing force constant um, the distance here also increases and uh, to convince you that there might be more um, of, a, of a correlation flash causation if we plot the measured activation barriers versus the sulfur lithium distance the longer this distance the less strong the bonding and the less strong the bonding really the activation barrier um, is lower but all these are, are causations. Um, the question is, does, does the lithium sulfur attraction really change? We can say we have a higher polarity of a bond. We can say we have more electron density here, but that really doesn't mean that the bond is actually stronger. And so what, what Ben decided is to, to get an, an idea of what the bond strength of the lithium sulfur attraction is. He tried to calculate formation energies. And this is sort of my, my favorite plot of all of this because he just built a supercell of the, the germanium phase and put one single tin atom in there. And then we calculated the formation energies for vacancies. In other words, how much energy it takes to remove a lithium. And we would believe that the energy that it takes to take something out is sort of at least linked to the strength that it is bonded, right? Chemically speaking. And now um, we, we use the cutoff of three angstroms. In orange is everything that is every lithium that is in closer distance than three angstroms to the site where a tin S4 polyhedron is sitting. And in blue, everything that is further away is so that is closer to the germanium case. And everything that is closer to the tin polyhedra has a higher formation energy. So clearly the lithium that is close in distance to this polyhedron is stronger bound. And uh, this I actually uh, like very much. Um, and so then to, to sort of uh, top this off, um, if, if you can calculate these, these potential energy landscapes and 
Um, what what Ben's group uh, did was pretty much just run not band calculations for the activation barriers. And in the germanium case, the activation barrier is lower. In the tin case, this is higher. Um, this is what we uh, what we had observed. But there's still the question, are these really electronic effects, right? This could still be a structural effect. Yes, we see the discrepancy that the unit cell is expanding and the distances get uh, closer. This could be um, an, an, a, a, a columbic uh, interaction, but that doesn't mean that there's no structural um, uh, thing at play. And so what, what Ben did, he then pretty much swapped the elements. We kept the structure fixed, the experimental structure we had. These are not relaxed calculations. And he put germanium in the tin structure and tin in the, in the germanium case structure. And so by just swapping the elements and keeping the structure fixed, the, the activation barriers for the tin case are also higher, which pretty much means it's not a structural effect. It really is the tin and the electron density from the tin that it then hands over to the sulfur um, is it, really doing the trick. And so uh, we at least believe that um, this, this, this idea of an inductive effect is true in LGPS. It has been observed in cathode active materials. This is something I'm good enough that in the 80s, so it's not surprising that there's an effect like this in the solid state. Um, but um, I think it's, 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 it's interesting to see that in solid ionic conductors, this also holds up. The question is, is this a general influence or is this just only the case in this structure that is a tunnel dominating? Um, I don't know if this really holds up in any other materials. And um, a lot of people are, are, we as well, are using this um, effect um, if we find strange changes in transport in our ionic conductors and we don't know the answer to it. So we blame it on the inductive effect. But I think the field has, has some work to do over the next few years to figure out if, if it's really reasonable to blame it on that um, or um, if, if there's even under, different underlying causes. And with that, I, I thank you for your attention and again for the invitation. And I, I hope that I was able to convince you that uh, solid ion conductors are fun to work with. Um, I think anyone that, that wants to work on transport theory or structural work um, will have fun in this field. And I think um, what, we, what we showed is um, that electronic and inductive effects really can play a role. And I think this is something that um, we sort of have underestimated uh, in, in the field so far. Um, of course, I need to thank the funding and it's not like I do any of the, the work. It's here, the pandemic uh, group picture. Um, so my people are do most of that work. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Wolfgang. Very nice talk. Uh, is there any question? Let's see. Uh, you can either raise your hand or, or ask for permission to ask. Questions? Okay, I'll, I'll take one question. Wolfgang, um, did you try or did you think of another replacement for the germanium, not only the tin? Um, yeah, um, this is something that we're looking in right now. Um, you can replace, actually, you can replace the phosphorus with antimony. Um, there should also be differences. So this is uh, our current goal um, to see if this if this still holds up. Um, the you can also get silicon on that site, um, but the. I, the, the silicon samples are really difficult to make. Um, uh, we usually just uh, get very impure samples. And I think there's only one group, um, Petita Lodge, that is able to make them um, through, a, through a very tricky uh, synthesis process. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, think, I think the next step should be playing with the phosphorus and, and see um, what changes there as well. Okay, thank you. I guess there are no other questions. Let's. Thanks, Wolfgang, again. Can I? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Who, who want to ask? <laughs> I, I would like to ask. Uh, Thomas, yes, time. Thomas, please. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so how, how would you summarize sort of the, the, the lesson here? Like, it, is it better to choose like a, a more electronegative atom to occupy your polyhedra in this case? Or is that sort of a, a, way, a way to summarize this? Or? I, I think I think the opposite. We need so these these polyhedral frameworks. They give us really really good like fast ionic conductors, and that's probably just because of the sulfur less than uh, the, because of the polyhedra. But 
I think anything that lowers the charge density, the electronic charge density, the negative charge density on the anions should give you fast transport. So um, you should have more electronegative elements in the center of the polyhedron, so lower uh, charge density um, on the side. And, and if we're moving between classes, this is a reason why, or at least I believe this is the reason why people are now looking more into the halides um, so the field is slowly moving away from the sulfides, but more going into the halides um, because and the, the chloride and bromide um, versions, uh, automatically you have uh, roughly half of the charge density um, that you would have for uh, from a sulfide anion. And um, so maybe we actually just have to shift to the materials classes. But anything that lowers the attraction and the force keeping lithium in place will be good for ionic motion. And we've seen that I think when we started, there was only one material that, that hit uh, above 10 millisiemens. Um, uh, that was the LGPS phase. Um, but over the last three or four years, um, we've, we've now have five or six materials that are above 10 millisiemens. And so the field has really uh, improved in, in trying to tailor transport and pretty much just like play a substitution game and figure out um, uh, which materials might be better. But yeah, um, great, uh, large unit cells, lower electrostatic attraction. Thanks. Thank you, Wolfgang. And if there are any other questions, you are welcome to communicate via emails. Uh, Correct. Thank you for, for joining us. We are moving now to our next speaker, Professor Alex Schechter from uh,